good afternoon. Welcome to you all. Um, I'm just going to start off by, um, in a minute, asking Simon, and, and I will introduce myself as well. Um, and also, just to say, we've had some input from IFE, from the event organisers, which we'll share with you a little later on. So uh, just to introduce myself, Joanna Dodd, and I'm the Managing Director of Rochester PR Group. And we specialise in helping international brands launch in the UK. And one of our core sectors of um, expertise is in food and drink brands. So we do a lot of work with food and drink companies coming into the UK, launching in the UK for the first time. So I'll be talking quite a bit about uh, why you, in our view, why you need to raise your profile to get known in the UK. Simon? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Simon Day. I've been working about 20 years in food and drink industry in the UK. Um, launched and created multiple brands over that time. Um, worked in a lot of different food categories, um, particularly in bringing uh, products in from outside of the UK into the UK. Um, and I'm now a consultant, early stage investor and uh, a co-founder in a couple of uh, food businesses. Great, thank you. So we're going to run this through. Um, we're not presenting in turn. We're going to be um, talking off um, the slides together when we've got something interesting to say. So um, really what we're going to go through today is a little bit about the UK market, um, the landscape, consumers, uh, competition and trends in the UK. Um, and that is really to make sure that this webinar is as useful for people who or maybe just looking at the UK and not planning to be over for IFE, maybe not this year or coming to a show later on in the year. Um, and then we're going to talk specifically more about what to do at our IFE or indeed another show, you know, how to prepare for it um, and what to do actually at the event. So we're going to start with um, some information about the UK. The first thing that we always say actually to any clients is um, UK is a great market to enter. Um, it's hugely receptive to innovation, loves new products, um, and food and drink is, is no different. But it's really important, obviously, that you understand what you're trying to um, communicate here in the UK and, and what your brand is you know, worth and how valuable it is. So it's all about communicating the value that you add as a brand, not purely just price. Um, and obviously, on the pricing thing, uh, one of the jobs you will need to do is make sure that you've worked out your pricing for the UK market because the margins that are expected by retailers um, are relatively high. Um, and the other thing we're going to talk about a bit is, is about understanding your route to market and your positioning, because that is also very, very important. You know, you can look at the target retailer maybe that you're really keen to get involved with and look at their positioning. It depends where you're aiming. So we have clients who go, obviously, as a mainstream brand or some who stay very much on the world food aisles. Um, there are lots of different ways to come in through, um, you know, wholesalers and the other options that people tend to when they talk, start talking to us talk about just the big supermarket retailers. Um, but we have our clients stocked in, in places like Lakeland, TK Maxx, B&M and Karen, who I think might be on this afternoon, um, also mentioned recently she's got some of her um, clients products in um, places like Anchor Store and Fair. So. There is more to the UK than just the, um, as we used to call them, the big four retailers. Um, the other thing I'd say about the UK in terms of our consumers um, is I think we often tend to assume that um, early adopters uh, of brands are going to be a younger generation. But actually, um, using my parents as an example, the older generation here in the UK, um, the retired, are often, but not always, but often time and uh, money rich. Um, and I know from my parents, they've got all the time in the world to, um, you know, wander around and find different supermarkets and visit different places and shop for new brands and um, new things that take their fancy. So the older shopper is is um, one way to look at the market. Don't always think that it's got to be that you've got to be targeting the the new, the younger generation. Um, so in terms of uh, characterising the UK consumer, an um, Italian colleague of mine once said to me that he thought of the UK as the teenagers of Europe, that um, Italian consumers were were like somebody who was middle-aged, has tried different things, but is very happy with, um, with what they like and what they don't like and uh, isn't really up for experimenting quite so much anymore. So... Uh, the the kind of downsides of the uh, UK consumer characteristic would be that they're very deal driven, 
quite low cooking skills, although that's an advantage if you have a convenience product. Um, currently, obviously worried about cost of living, probably like ev- everyone um, globally. Um, but yeah, on the upside, super adventurous, um, really ready to try new things. And it's obviously a big market. Um, and if you're coming from outside of Europe, then UK can really be a gateway to Europe. And a lot of the trends that kick off in the UK uh, do sp- spread around Europe and convenience, food to go uh, are good examples of that. So in terms of the UK market, I, I think for um, all of our clients, whatever sector they're in, we often say, you know, you, you could have done more market research or you could have investigated the UK market more. There are a lot of sources that you can find on the UK market Um some of them are behind paywalls. Um, some of them, you know, will give away some information for free, like this from Mintel, for example, um, gives away some of its uh, trends, but not necessarily all of them. But there is a lot of information that you can find. And we really recommend that you do spend some time looking around and finding out more about uh, your sector um, and your potential retailers, your potential market entry route. Um this one, for example, looks uh, at, you know, the out of home market um, and what's going on in there. So, again, not just pure retail when we're looking at food and drink brands, both for us and for Simon. You know, it doesn't have to be just purely through retail outlets that we work on food and drink brands. Um, and one of the companies that is really great at sharing um, that we really rate is Kantar. You'll hear them. They, they give loads of um uh, presentations they're very generous with sharing their information some of which you can find on their site um, easily searchable and this is just an example of um, information that they publish about the the retail landscape particularly looking at the big uh, supermarket retailers and you can find this moves the the, the data will move quite quickly um, and um, you can see at the bottom there 12 weeks so that they'll move this data on but that just gives you a snapshot of what um, the supermarket Uh, outlooks look like in the UK Um, and I think um, Simon you were going to say as well um, you know about food service and not just looking purely retail but yeah definitely that food services um, can be much quicker to bring product to market so sometimes when you're launching very very helpful to get things away quicker in um, in food service and that can be your showcase in the future for retail food service can be its its own market um, obviously as well um but on this on the points about the the differences between the different retailers i'm uh, just going to mention as well that if you look at specific categories the pitch can change quite a lot so um obviously if you're able to do so get access to information yourself or partner up with someone that has access to the information and just examples in 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 my experience um in plant-based um that a product that i was launching in plant-based it, if I launched it in Sainsbury's, I'd probably expect it to do about twice the rate of sale um, that it did in Asda, even though those are equivalent um, size retailers. But some products kind of fly much quicker in one retailer than another. And then on a different category like Ready Meals, Asda uh, has a, a strong reputation in, in that category and the and it might be the, the opposite way around. So it's always worth, worth uh, diving into the specifics of, of your category area as well. Yeah, definitely. The more detailed research you do, uh, the better it is for you. Um, again, a few more um, pieces of information here. We we are still dominated by those supermarkets that we just showed you, but there has been a definite shift towards online and discounters, which is growing. Um, and particularly the, the discounter element, we've seen a lot for our clients in the last few years. It's become a, a, a big channel for them. Um, and a couple of other pieces, um, and again, Simon's going to pick up on this in a minute, but a couple of other pieces that are worth knowing about the UK market. Um, we are very uh, reliant on private label. We have a you know, big own label um, market here. So actually, where you think you're competing against other branded goods, um, often private label, the, the retailer's own brand, is, is very strong in its own right. So they should always be considered a competitor. Uh, And the other thing that I think is really important to know is that we are very promotionally driven here in the UK. We we are a real um, heavy promotion market and that will make a difference to you. Yeah, two two things I want to stress here. One is um, in terms of the strength of own label, if you are able to supply own label as well as potentially uh, pushing your your brand, that can really help with the strategic 
uh, relationship that you have with a retailer and they may well afford your brand more space uh, because of the own label relationship um and then the other side the, the promotions uh, very common to see brands coming into the uk who don't allocate enough funding at the outset for promotions um potentially decide that they will do promotions um at kind of zero percent margin or maybe even as a as a loss leader but oftentimes the volume sold on on promotion could be uh for between 40 and 60 percent so if you're not making money on promotions you're you're probably unlikely to be a very profitable band brand in the uk so it's really important to bear in mind and i think that generally um simon about investing i think we probably we'll mention it again later but the point about investing in your brand um you know it's not it's not a it's not a cheap market to uh, be successful in. So I think whatever sector you're in, you do have to have the budget behind you to make sure that you've got the best chance of being success. But I think we talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, so what you really uh, need to do um, in terms of getting ready um, are, um, we've already said, you know, um, do some research but there are loads of places that you can find this sort of research apart from the obvious retailer information um that we talked about before there are uh, a lot of articles if you have a quick google around about uh, you know the topic that you're interested in and of course as a pr person i would recommend that you do this but there's some great um stories out there where you can find what other brands have been doing that give you a lot of really um detailed information about how other um, products have managed it. There was one example, another one in real business. Um, and this one from a particular brand, again, if you search by brand, um, Genius, um, talking about how um, she managed to get her product in store. So there is a lot of information out there that you can find um, that's quite useful in terms of what other people have done to get their um, brands on shelf. So do spend a bit of time because the more you read about the UK market, you may have already done this, of course, in your home territory, but the more that you spend time looking at the UK market, uh, the, you know, the better off you're going to be in terms of talking to uh, retailers or to anybody else about your product. Uh, and Simon, from your point of view, um, having launched a fair few numbers of products in, in, in your time, um, have you done any of these great um, articles on how you managed it or shared any? Um, of I've done a podcast. <laughs> well, that's good. Podcast, um, there's a uh... Yes, there's there's a few there's some really good podcasts actually out, out there, aren't there? And uh, maybe we can um, drop some uh, a link in the in the chat later. But um, yeah, I think some of that some of those podcasts are are good to listen to. Yeah, it's true. Um, I, it's sort of it's almost easier to cut and paste um, online articles. But you're right when when you sort of talk about the media, there's loads of different opportunities, and podcasts have certainly become really really strong and, and really um, interesting, I think, for uh, for brands to listen to. So other things that you need to do now, um, if you're coming to your trade show, or as we said, you know, if you're coming over to the UK, think about bringing your brand over. Um, obviously, just do the, the, the amount of diligence that you need to do, due diligence on whether your brand's right for the UK and whether it meets all food safety and legal requirements. Um, there, that information you can always find on the government website. Um, so uh, important to check that out or get advice um, so that you can be sure about how you're going to work for your um, UK market entry, your route to market and how that's going to work for you. Um, and I think, um, I think Simon, you were mentioning as well about factory accreditation and stuff. Yeah, so just as, as an example, I mean, uh, BRC is a, a typical um, factory accreditation for supplying UK retail. And it might be that even if your product's an ingredient and you're supplying it to a food manufacturer in the UK, that if that product ultimately ends up in a, in one of the big retailers, um, that you're still going to need that accreditation to supply. And it's very common to see um, people fall down on that basis, even though you know people like their product, um, maybe like the price, but those accreditations are just um, kind of red lines that, that can't be... Uh, navigated yeah I, I know we've certainly met people at um shows before or people who've who've attended shows and then say they actually found out afterwards that their product wasn't right for whatever reason for the uk market which is is a shame after the investment they've made um so one things that we would always say um from our point of view um often a piece of work that we do with clients is really to get your messaging right for the uk market um 
there's three things really we concentrate in our job. One is what you're going to say. Who two is who you need to say it to, and three is you know where you need to say it or what the tactics are that you're going to distribute your message through. So really important that you think about your brand now. Um, I know you know it, but think about your brand, why it's right for the UK, and and what your key umbrella message is, so that you know when you're at the show or even when you're not or when you're talking to people beforehand you can explain it really really clearly and simply and um also with huge excitement and joy in your in your voice you know whether it's the first day of IFE or the last day and whether it's you know the first hour or the last hour of the day um because it, it's really important that you nail that message every time because you you know you're not sure who you're talking to at the at the start of the conversation you can't always read the badge for example so make sure you've thought about um your your story for the UK why you're right what your proof points are. It could be, you know, your growth in another market and why that's so relevant to the UK, but make it as, as focused on the UK as possible um, about your product. And there's underlining messages that of course you can use, but often at a trade show, to be fair, the only one you really get around to being able to say or have time to say is your first key umbrella message um, if, you're, if you're busy, but make sure you get that right um, before you come over to the UK. Um, now, this is, I think, often makes or breaks um, a lot of brand success in the UK, and that's which model they use for which route to market they use for really accessing the UK market. So um, first thing to do is to understand what you're what you're trying to achieve. And there are different models are suitable for different outcomes. So maybe you're trying to build a uh, long term value and it's a it, you're happy with a slow um, but really sustainable build in the UK. Maybe you need quick top line sales growth and you're willing to spend a lot of money to achieve that um maybe you're not willing to spend a lot of money and you really need profitable sales um from the start in the uk so and different models suit those different um different goals so being really clear on that and then picking a model that that fits that is is very important um wanted to give an example of a few different models um a full service partner might be uh a partner who does everything for you um even controls the uh transport potentially from the factory gate um wherever you're based um and that they can do the sales marketing uh, and the distribution everything and they may be able to really help you build your strategy for the uk as well um I just there's the classic kind of distributor uh, models and then um there are slightly more creative things. If you find a manufacturer in the UK that you're happy to manufacture your product, it might be that that manufacturer already supplies a lot of the customers you target and you can piggyback on that capability. And in some cases, that might be a bit of a cheaper way to do it than having a separate distributor. Um, but it does put you in the hands of the manufacturer to a great degree. Um, then there's joint ventures. Uh, in terms of having a team in the UK, um, two models I commonly see are to employ a UK country manager, uh, a single individual, probably someone quite experienced, um, who can sort a lot of this stuff on, on your behalf. Um, and then obviously there's the option to build a full team in the UK. Um, but I guess the key point that we wanted to make about that was um, that that feels like something to do once you really have proof that your product's going to going to work in the UK and do see quite a lot of businesses come over uh, very confident and but then realize that there's a lot more competition in the UK for their offer than they thought there was and they've already committed to a full UK team and that that often ends um, uh, not favorably so something to look out for. And Simon of, of these which one do you see most often? Or, or do you see? Uh, I think like di distributors re is is probably uh, yeah the the most the most common. Um, the ones that have really accelerated very quickly. Quite often, I see them use a, more of a full service um, partner. So uh, yeah, those are the the ones I see. And then the kind of big failures, I'd say, is more common in if somebody's putting a full UK um team in because it's really really hard to pay off that that overhead um but uh yeah it, it varies obviously and and different models suit different businesses yeah 
Um, so the other thing, if you have got a retailer in mind, we showed earlier that that graph of, of the big retailers. If you have got a retailer in mind, do make sure that you find out as much about them as, as you possibly can, checking out their stores. If you're not based over here, get somebody else to go out and take some pictures for you and understand what's on shelf at the moment. Um, we quite often do that for brands. And it's really interesting how they come back and say, gosh, I didn't realize, you know, that there were this many different brands or that this much shelf space was given over to this one product line and things like that. So it is always worth it. Um, if you can coming over and, and visiting and, and finding that out, obviously try and track down things like the name, the name of the buyer um, and, and make contact with them before you come over for any show. If you've got something meaningful to talk to them about. Um, some of them are quite good on their websites. They will post something. Some, some of them have forms that you can fill in to make initial contact. Um, so here's just an example, for example, of Sainsbury's site. Um, but the more that you understand them and what they're trying to achieve and, and their goals and what they're doing at the moment, um, then the, the more likely you are going to be able to match your message or your story to what they're looking for. So again, it's a bit of a recurring theme, but but you know, do your homework, make sure you've really understood who you're talking to. Um, then I did want to say a bit about PR, of course, and how important it is. Um, partly because we believe it, but obviously partly because we found it to be true that um, uh, some some good pow uh, powerful profile on your business can help you when you when you come over here. So we have in the UK an immense array of um, media. Um, to engage with uh, both trade and consumer. So for each sector of the trade, there's there's a there's at least one, often many more publications to reach them. And then from the consumer side, obviously, depending on what sort of product you might have, there, there's all the nationals, there's the women's magazines, lifestyle magazines, health and fitness magazines. So depending on your product, there will be a, a lot of media uh, that are relevant. And not forgetting, as Simon said, it's not just about print media. There's, you know, there's a lot online, there's, there's podcasts, there's radio, TV. One of the questions we get asked uh, a bit is about social media. Um, and, you know, can I use just social media to, to prove my, my uh, case for, for the UK? We, we do often see um, brands which, which have started, obviously, in a home territory where may, maybe English isn't, isn't uh, spoken language. So that is quite a difficult transition to move your your whole Instagram account or whatever it might be from uh, one language into another to coincide with when you're coming over to the UK. So um, think about that. I, you know, if that's the case, I wouldn't, I would really start a new one probably in English if you're going to, this is really going to be a big market for you. But social media is certainly really valuable. Um, we were talking this morning when we ran this one earlier for, um, a different time zone about yeah. media working slightly differently and we certainly see that for our clients that, that there's a different way that often some countries use social media which is more advertising broadcasting almost and and the UK much more engaging Simon do you yeah I, yeah on social media I was going to say that um, I think sometimes a bit of a myth about how much it can drive your your business and that there are very few brands that you see where really their success is born out of their social media um there's an example in the uk called uh, little moons which is a, a a famous example which blew up on tiktok and and did very well but actually a lot of that came from the fact that the mainstream media picked up that story um and that they're still quoted a lot because it's a very exceptional um case an unusual case and and part of it was the novelty of brands using TikTok at that stage. And obviously it's, it's a lot less novel now. So, um, yeah, it can be overblown. And the other thing was just to say that th this interaction between social media and and all other forms of media, if you, in the end, if you've got a great story, if you've got a charismatic founder um, and, and you're telling it in a, in a really engaging way, that comes across well on social media, in, in press, on podcasts. Yeah. in all um in all forms so it tend the best brands tend to uh link it all up together and and be telling a great story on all platforms you know what one reason i think people think social well uh, fingers crossed hope that social media is going to do it is because social media is perceived as being uh less expensive i you know we can just do that ourselves but actually um yeah 
I, I would agree with you. It doesn't work just in isolation. Um, but but do reach out to the media, invite them to come and see you, send them products, you know, send them your products to taste. Um, and as as Simon was saying, you know, charismatic leaders, you know, if you if you are going to be quite forthright in your in your views, you know, talk about the trends that you're predict, predicting and offer to speak at events. There are a lot of events around where they're looking to hear from people with strong opinions on what's going to be the next big trend in the UK um, and also enter awards um, you know if you've got awards from your home territory fantastic um, but you know it is always worth thinking about entering some here in the UK as well and that's just one of them there are others um, that are around um, thank you to IFE I think um, one of you maybe Nicola or Sophie or maybe both are on um, this this afternoon so um, IFE have provided us with some information this is this is useful it gives you an idea of the media that are going to be at the show um, and Nicola is your main point of contact if you want to talk to her um, about the PR opportunity if you are um, attending um, the other thing, I think, just from IFE's point of view, I, I think they're still taking inquiries. It might be fully booked on exhibitor space, but you never know. Um, so do do give them a shout. Probably one of the big mistakes we see when people um, coming over that they, you know, they, they're busy booking their exhibitor space and then forget to do some of the other things which are really important about getting your logo onto all the website and making sure that you detail your products. Because actually when people go on to find you, um, and, they, and all they get is the company name, there isn't much they've got to go on in terms of what you are and what you're about. So when they're planning their visit, they're going to be looking at the website and that's where you do want to stand out. Um, they do run a Meet the Buyer programme, um, which does cost you, but um, I'm not sure if that's, again, whether they've still got spaces for that. But it, if you are if you are an exhibitor for IFE or planning to be next time, you know, do make sure that you take advantage of all of this at the beginning. And um, like I said before, there are awards um, that they run um, themselves, IFE, the World Food Innovation Awards. So, you know, there's an opportunity to enter. There's lots of other things there that IFE can help you with in terms of getting your message across. So and this will be the, the same of, um, you know, other other shows too, not necessarily in the food and drink arena. But do get in touch with them because, um, you know, they are the source of information for IFE and there may be some PR opportunities around that they know about that a journalist has come to them about a particular trend and you might be the right sort of brand uh, to be in touch with them. So um, if you are going and if you are an exhibitor um, and you're suddenly thinking, gosh, I haven't made enough of this uh, yet, do do get in touch with them and um, do some more do some more work on it because it will help you be successful um, at the show. So um, sort of summarising what we said about before you come, um, there's, you know, there's quite a lot there, um, Simon, that we've rattled through, but do you want to have a go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just uh, to be well prepared and, and research, obviously, the UK market and get specific to your category as you can, um, see what you can find, but also the earlier you get partners involved, the more they can help you with that research. Um, and then working out, you know, where you're, how you fit um in in the uk scene what your unique selling point is how you stand out from the competition etc um getting that route to market in place absolutely vital if someone's going to talk to you at the show um that there's a way that they can buy your product um and then we talked about uh, all the opportunities that there are around the exhibition as well as just um uh, taking a stand great so, so all of that sort of before you get here, before you come along. And then um, we wanted to just uh, talk a bit more about uh, the show itself and what you should do. And again, um, uh, some information from IFE. And, and this is relevant, as I said before, for any show really in a way. But IFE have a press office function, which is digital only now. So there's no longer any press office to go and visit and um, novel uh, journalists. But it's, it's still in, very important to have your releases up there um make contact you know if there are things like tasting sessions you might be able to get involved in that um we're going to talk a bit about this um simon's going to mention this a bit as well but arranging meetings with people um you know is is really important and one thing that i was just agreeing with ife about when i was talking to them the other day about this is you are on show um and i mentioned this right at the beginning you are on show when you're there it, it's amazing how often people actually look um, as if they don't really want to be there. They're sitting on their phone or they're, you know, this or they're typing away. But, um, you know, you you just don't know um, who's going to be passing your your stand next. So, 
treat every visitor as a, as a potential, um, you know, business partner because you don't know who they know um, and how they might be able to help you. Um, there are, you know, a lot of people around at the show who at the beginning or maybe you you won't recognise a name, but could be really important for you, could be your the right entry point for you into the UK. So although IFE doesn't necessarily um, publish these all, uh, you know, there's some great people there, whether that's wholesalers, um, you know, that, that you may not have heard from before, but could be the right sort of route to entry. Um, and the other thing that when we were talking about it, Nicola and I, um, you know, she she was saying the same thing that we've really been saying up until now now which is know how your project will enter the UK and be quite confident about that know your sort of argument and process because you may get asked that question by somebody visiting your stand and it's really important that you've got the answer ready um going back to my point about messaging and then also make it you know an easy process to buy your buy your product because you know if you um if you haven't if you're not ready or it's another 6 months or something else you know actually um, you know, somebody's going to come along and think, oh, that's great. But now I can't act- actually take this conversation any further. So make sure that you've got all the right information um, and that you know what you're going to be uh, pitching to people when they come and see you. So work hard on the day, really. I, I was going to, before I talk on this slide, I was going to quickly um, hold my hands up and mention a bad experience I had when I was exhibiting at a show. So um uh, I was exhibiting in New York at Speciality and Fine Food yeah. Fair, and it was we were taking chocolates, and um, they were firstly they were impounded in somewhere in Ohio or, or somewhere in the US because they had alcohol in, and we'd failed to realise that that m- might mean that they got stopped at customs. Um, so we had no product with us, only uh, packaging, and we didn't have any distributor lined up. So everyone that came to our stand, we we couldn't sample uh, product and we had no way of supplying them. So sometimes you learn these lessons the, the hard way. Um, it was quite a lot of years ago, but it, it does happen and we wouldn't like you to make the same mistakes. Um, did you get anywhere afterwards? Did you manage to retrieve? Uh, no, no, it was, no. A, it was a write-off. Yeah, it was a disaster. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> no, no redeeming features of that story. Um, so then uh, in terms of the contacts that you want before you arrive, um, we talked about uh, distributor or brand representative in the UK and um, obviously customers and buyers are they are going to be very high on, on your list. But there are a few other types of people that you might want to make contact with. Uh, one group are people that are going to feedback, give you really honest feedback. So people that don't have an agenda, people you're not employing or paying. Um, that will tell you the truth about your product. And um, I've definitely served that function for other people in the past, for example, on packaging formats where a product was vacuum packed um, and that really wouldn't have have been uh, listed by a UK retailer in that category. Um, And they just needed a simple packaging format change to make themselves uh, potentially applicable to the UK. So people that give you honest feedback um, and then connectors and hype builders are the kind of people that you other people when you go to a show you often just you bump into people walking around that you know it's it's a small world the food world and quite often there's just kind of one or two brands at each show that everyone's talking about if you can be one of those brands you get people get directed to your stand from from all over the place um i went to plant-based world expo recently and an example of that brand was La Vie. They're, they uh, have a plant-based bacon product and they'd obviously done a lot of work in that regard. And um, yeah, everyone was talking about them at the show. So there's making contact with these people and then wherever possible, do not rely on bumping into them randomly at the show or um, them passing your stand. It's hard to get around all the stands at a show. So make sure you book in meetings and that can be the meeting can be at your stand. It could be before the show. It could be after the show. It could be in a coffee shop around the corner or whatever, but um, wherever is convenient for that, that person to meet you really. Um, but very important to book in meetings. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I, I, I think I usually get sort of almost, you know, I don't know, a meter inside um, and always find somebody to say, what have you seen that's really interesting today? And it, it is true. You either get that sense, that sense of, oh, there's lots of this around again. Or, you know, or people will say, oh, this one, stand, whatever. It's really worth looking at. And it, it's interesting if you do that, um, you do get 
some really good answers, yeah. Okay, so uh, when you go to a show, it's an exhausting experience. Um, and often after afterwards, the people that have been at the show are, are, very, t- are very tired, are fed up of talking about their product um, constantly for, for three days, have a load of disorganized notes. Um, so that's going to be the majority of the of the businesses there. So you can really stand out from that. This is your opportunity to really, really set yourself apart is by having a, having a brilliant follow up to what you've done at the show. So some bits of advice, I, I guess, like take really great notes when you're at the show, like personal notes about what that that person was interested in, what they want to see in the follow up and make sure you follow up accordingly. Um, contact everyone promptly while you're still top of their mind. I say within a, within a week, by the end of the following week, I normally think is a uh, is good time to, to set yourself to get every, around everybody and then make it, um, make it really personal. So um, often it gets handed on to someone else in the business to do the follow-up, but I think the person that had the conversation following up, that makes a big, big difference. Um, a couple of examples uh, uh, that are pictured here, the one on the left is um, a brand called Nice, which is a canned wine business that um, I'm invested in. And they're really, really worth a follow. That team are amazing at, at, at follow-ups and uh, buyer contacts. Very imaginative. The one that's pictured is a, a branded jigsaw they made because they had conversations with the buyer about being the missing piece in the puzzle of their category. So just a clever, more interesting than normal follow-up. Um, the random book on the right is um, an example from me that I had a conversation with somebody at a show. We discovered we both had a, that David Attenborough was a bit of a hero for both of us. He's a wildlife presenter in the UK, if if you haven't heard of him. And um, nothing to do with business whatsoever, but just a shared interest. And uh, I sent him um, a, a book that I'd recommended to him with a note inside and that was the thing that he remembered about about me so those kind of things can really work yeah um some more points on follow-up uh, it really comes across well if you give the next date that you'll be in in the uk so if they say you know when will you be back in the uk and you say oh i don't know it doesn't sound like you're very committed um to the UK market. So having that next date already set, it also makes it much easier for them to say yes to a meeting. Um, if you say, I'm coming over anywhere, I'm going to be near your office on these dates and you give them three dates or something. And can I just pop in? Then uh, kind of takes the pressure off the meeting and they're much more likely to say yes. Look for actions that are very hard to say no to. So if you say, look, I'd really like to show you a product that I haven't shown anyone else um, I think it could be an exclusive for you, those kind of things. Uh, it's more likely that you're going to get a meeting. Um, even if you don't have full intention to give them exclusivity, it might be worth a shot. Um, and then following up with some more news uh, that suggests that there's a kind of momentum building. If you say that you've got other listings from the show, for example, or that your rate of sale has gone up in one of your customers um or that there's a a massive mob of people trying to buy your product in every store like the uh the prime energy drinks that are pictured at at the top there um yeah any news that you've got to share that keeps you current um and is new that's worth including in the follow-up so kind of wrapping up with common themes of um success um very important to have a an excellent partner in the UK or an excellent team in the UK if you're going to do it um, your, yourself. You, you need a product that sells well in the UK and you won't know that for sure until you get on, on shelf. So, um, yeah, and that links a lot to the gap. Is it a product that isn't really present in the UK? So, uh, some sort of gap could be a, a better version but you often have to be much better than, than the incumbent to succeed. So um, I always think that it's more likely that your percentage chance of succeeding is much higher 
if you're addressing a, a, a total gap, then it is a kind of better version of something that's already here. Um, if you can surf a wave, then that's fantastic. Might be uh, gut health, plant-based, um, something that is on the up. Um, Joanna, I think you mentioned, you, we talked before about the fact that sometimes you can create your own wave. So yeah. I don't know yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, the media are very open to sort of the new trends, the, the the new ideas. So if you genuinely think you are going to be starting something new, then then the media um, and that includes sort of the national media are really interested in it. And you can quite often get quite a lot of a uh, lot of attention because I think you're right, Simon, the the, the gap thing is very important because otherwise the question that you'll tend to get was, you know, if, if this is my shelf space who who do you want me to knock out if I'm going to bring you in unless mm. you, are, you know unless it is a real gap then it is you know wh why would they take you against something that's already on shelf and selling but yeah if you can if you can create a new wave and create a a new new category by um you know what you're bringing into the UK market then that's that's always going to go down well um if you're frustrated that you're not part of one of the the waves that's getting talked about by everyone um, example of uh, a lady I work with called Amelia. She started a bean um, business, and she was pretty frustrated that alternative um, proteins, so um, plant-based meats, were getting a huge amount of attention. Um, so she kind of the counter wave that she launched was to say, you know, here's a natural solution: beans, which already have the protein um are really convenient to use super tasty um aren't processed and have the benefit of of additional fibers and and so on so that counter wave you know she got a lot of press coverage out of that and a lot of buyer interest by presenting an alternative story so there's always a different way to okay. to spin it um i'm quite passionate about distribution as a num as the number one marketing tool um, again, there's a lady called Lucy who, who's Lucy Busk, who's the founder of Nice, the canned wine business I mentioned earlier, who talks fantastically on this subject. But it might be that the marketing investment that you make in the beginning is more about getting distribution than it is about creating awareness. Obviously, there's not a lot of point in spending huge amounts of money creating consumer awareness when your product isn't available anywhere. And from a PR perspective, um, journalists aren't particularly going to want to talk about products that aren't available anywhere. So um, the example that's on the screen, Levic and the bacon, they their advertising was kind of about how they weren't available in the UK. And really, obviously, that's just designed to stimulate some conversation with with buyers. And they were successful in, in uh, getting quite a few listings on the back of that. Um, I've put the example of Avera on the right hand side. It's a brand I worked with, which ticked kind of a, all of these boxes um, at the same time. And that went rapidly from zero to about 20, uh, 20 million plus of sales in the UK in about in, in two years, two and a half years. So um, it's possible to grow really quickly if you if you do tick all the boxes. And then in terms of investment, just lastly, um that you know you really want a proof point of success you want to test your product in the in the market there's a certain amount of investment that you're going to have to make up front to uh, make that happen um but and then you also probably want to be holding back some investment you want a a, a pot of uh, money that's ready that if you succeed you can really really get behind it um quite quickly so yeah i agree so that that's sort of um, the end of our uh, presentation. We're really happy to answer some questions. I know because uh, we can see that um, people have been um, sending them on, and we had a few in advance, such as from um, after this morning session, which we'll use. But do feel um, free to get in touch with me or Simon afterwards. Um, and, uh, you know, we will both be there at IFE. So very happy to be one of the people you meet and also very happy both of us to be one of those honest people who will tell you, uh, you know, what, what we think of your product. Um, us, us partly because actually there's no point in us trying to um, 
PR something, you know, that that doesn't work. So we're always very keen to tell a client about that. But do, uh, yeah, do reach out. And if it's not right away um, around IFE, um, come back to us at any time. But um, maybe, Suzanne, if there's any questions that you got earlier or want to share with us. Yeah, I can read those out. So um, it says, you mentioned raising profile. When do you suggest doing this? Yeah, okay. So, um a question that we get a lot um and um there's no one correct answer for anybody because as Simon and I were sort of talking about you could be you know trying to um talk about a new wave or there's a gap in the market and you're coming to fill it or you could be saying I'm actually on shelf uh, and here I am so um th- there's a lot of different opportunities that you've got to talk about yourself um the main thing we we always say is you've got one chance to make that first impression so don't don't ruin it don't make don't either go too early or uh, you know perversely leave it too late because actually if you are trying to say that you're new then you obviously need to keep your rate of sale up in order to keep your listing say if you're on a retailer shelf um but equally you don't want to sort of be saying oh we've been here for six months and now we want to talk to you about why why we're here in the UK because everyone goes six months is you know it's a long time and there'll be a new thing coming up so um no, no one correct answer. It does. It does very much depend on each individual brand's, um, you know, uh, sort of trajectory here and what they're going to be doing. Um, but, but if you're doing it yourself, uh, you know, give it a lot of thought as to what's your best time to actually really announce uh, what you're doing. One of the things that people often do, for example, it weirdly is to talk about. Well, it's not them. It's taken out of the hand. Somebody talks about they've taken office space over here, um, or you know, or, or something like that, or you know, and that's a real shame because you've actually just just missed a fantastic story um, just because you're, you know, the estate agent who have let you your office wants to announce that you're, you've uh, you've joined. So weirdly, some things like that can sometimes scupper you as as sometimes can be appointing somebody. Um, not that it scuppers you, but make sure you use that story at the right time and that it's not gone out already. And, um, you know, your your big launch is is, is blown. So think about it you're going to have lots of different opportunities to talk to the media um and it's really just working out what's what's going to be your strongest set of stories and when you're going to release them so sort of an annoying there's no one right answer but it is certainly something you should really think about and uh make a a a good plan around simon would you just yeah just to give a couple of specific examples in my experience so um for vera the big success for us there was uh, talking about the world's first bleeding steak, uh, first bleeding plant-based steak. Um, and that got a lot of attention because, um, you know, it was a polarizing issue of everyone that thinks that you shouldn't have vegan uh, meat alternatives weighed in. Mm. So all the press that were on that side covered it. And then all the press that were on the side of this is exciting, new future of food covered it. Um, and that was at, at launch, you know, that was a real kind of launch story and that, that mm. made a big impression and a lot of our subsequent listings were on the back of that. Um, and then the other one on the canned wine business was that's a female founded business in a male dominated uh, wine trade. And um, so that was, there was the launch story that wasn't such a big story necessarily for that product, but then there was a kind of building story a bit later about, uh, you know, female founder making waves in, in male dominated wine industry so um yeah it can be different for for different brands but i think i think generally it's a good point we 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 love founder stories we love profile stories um here in the uk so um that can work really well we've we've got a couple of um husband and wife um run businesses owned businesses and uh, again you know that that goes down very well with the media so yeah it, it's really working out all the different angles stories you've got and then using them at the right time to your advantage. Next question is, which is better social media or normal media? Well, I think we slightly, I think we probably slightly answer that already, which is um, a combination of, of all. I, I think if, I think if we we would prioritize normal, I don't know, mainstream, I don't know whether that's the right thing in terms of really making an impact. Um, but social is hugely important nowadays and, and we tend to run them both at the both together to, you know, one can feed off another one. 
Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't pick unless it's a budget issue and you've got to pick. Um, then maybe um, that would be a different decision. But generally speaking, for our for our clients when they're coming into the UK, we always say don't don't stick to sort of one tactic. Actually, it, it's it's often this combination of different tactics that's going to work really well for you um, in the UK market. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't pick one or the other. Um, to be and honest. I just say make try and make your social media into a PR story in itself. So um, if you you know if you're just putting ads and pretty pictures of food on your social media that isn't going to be a story um but for squeaky bean brand i created we um put seven uh content creators influencers in a in a big um mansion house in the countryside and um challenged them only one of them was vegan challenged them to eat vegan for 21 days and create content all the time they were in there so that was a social media project but it was also a a PR story yeah and and those are the things that really work the best in my in in my view and where you get you know more you get more bang for your buck as we say you get more more value for the for the money that you put in yeah and also I think it's a good example of um you know we were saying earlier that you know in, often people think social media is free but actually that's a good example of something that you have to invest in to make that work but when you do it can work really really well rather than as you say the sort of um the free alternative which might be just pictures but is not going to get much attention at all so yeah I agree with you um and just time for one final question um if you're not yet a brand in the UK and not exhibiting at IFE but really interested to know how to go about it what kind of would your top tips be as the sort of key outtakes from the presentation? Simon, do you want to start? Um, I'd just say if you haven't even started thinking about it by now, you're going to be very pushed for time. If and if you have decent contacts in the UK or um, a, a partner already set in the UK, um, then probably you have a chance to pull everything together in, in, in time for ife but um don't do it half-heartedly you know and and spend the money to not get a return make sure that you you do kind of try and pull everything together we've talked about um and really really go for it if you're going to do it and and also you know if you're not ready for for this ife you know it's a really good opportunity to come over if you can or you know get somebody to visit on your behalf but to to see what's happening to see what's working um and then you know that that will kick start your sort of understanding of what the uk market is about so um trade shows are always a great um you know great place to meet people and find out what's going on and listen to loads of uh, which, which actually sometimes you can't even do when you're exhibiting but listen to loads of the talks and things because you will you will learn a lot um but i think the main things as we've said today, you know, whether whether it's about this year's IFE or, or next, you know, is do do an enormous amount of thinking and research into the market, um, um, particularly why you're going to be right for the UK and, and you're the right route, route sort of that you're going to use to get into the UK. Um, because with all of that, armed with all of that, you're going to be a much, much better prospect for um you know re- whether it's a retail or on shelf brand you're going to you're going to pitch your story so much more successfully from start to finish i think so yeah well thank thank you very much everybody um and we'll send out um a recording afterwards and um if you as i say if you want to get in touch then do give us give us a shout thank you very thanks much. everyone see you at, see you at ife yeah see you there bye <laughs>